proud member of the class of 80, and I'm the chair of the European Alumni Council. Welcome to this third literary aperitif. Uh, it's the th third time we are getting together, bringing together alumni from all over the world and addressing important topics and interesting um, workshops and seminars. Today, we have two alums, uh, Randy Stabbins, class of 95, who lives in Reykjavik in Iceland, and Marjorie Wenther, class made of mine, class of 80, who lives and ba is based in Charleston, South Carolina. Together, they're gonna bring us a, a, an interesting, stimulating and engaging workshop we are gonna to work together on found poetry or erased poetry. Um, it is wonderful to have such a large number of participants from all graduating classes. We have a few students attending, a few older alums like me and a few other classmates, class of 80, and uh, alumni joining from all over the world. I see people from the States, I see people from Lebanon, from uh, Kuwait, from France, from Germany. It's so wonderful to bring our network together and to recognize each other after so many years and, and be together and explore together and learn together again. So without further ado, I'd just like to hand over to our two distinguished poets, Marjorie and Randy, and just uh, have, us, have them take us through this incredible journey and have us learn so much and interesting um, things today. Thank you. All right, um, thank you, Sylvia, for getting us all organized. And um, I also want to uh, thank Nadia Abdo Heath for, I think, suggesting um, this. To, uh, okay, and she's here somewhere. Um, can you all hear me? Great. All right. So um, I'm going to start, and then Randy's going to jump in. I'm going to give you the lay of the land before we. Um, before I introduce the topic, um, we're gonna each take a few minutes and just talk to you about found poetry. And then we're gonna share some of our own and, and try to share a little of our process. And um, you know, just kind of have general introductions for the first half hour so that you feel really comfortable with what you're gonna do in the breakout rooms. Then you'll go into breakout rooms um, for about 15, 20 minutes and you'll be talking about it and, and writing and Randy will give you more specific um, instructions. And um, then we'll all come back together and hopefully some of you will, will share your work. And then if you have questions, um, we'll, we'll uh, get to them then. Okay, does that sound good? Just so you, so you uh, have a sense of, of how we, we've planned this. Um, so I'm gonna uh, open with a quote from a poet, uh, one of my favorite poets, an American poet who was a doctor, um, William Carlos Williams. Maybe some of you studied him in college. Um, he, in his poem, Asphodel, the Greenery Flower, he wrote, it is difficult to get the news from poems, yet men die miserably every day for the lack of what is found there. Um, and, you know, the, it, this, uh, very famous um, stanza really jumped out at me when we were putting our program together because so much of what's in the news <clears throat> is, is sort of unexamined. Um, we might read it in a moment, but you know, then put it away and move on to the next story. And um, you know, <clears throat> so much of our news is comprised of sound bites. And, you know, that characterize something that happened perhaps, um, but it can be limited and it can be stilted. And, you know, some stories are underreported, of course. Um, and writing poems tied to a text, particularly a, um, something in the news, which we, you know, are suggesting you, you try, um, it can kind of counteract, excuse me, counteract this practice and find um, what I think of as the, the sort of humanity, the inherent humanity in a situation. Um, you know, what happens to the people? And um, the poet Robert Haas talked about poetry um, helping refresh the idea of, of justice, which, and create images of, of justice. And, you know, part of what we want you to think about is, you know, things that are of great concern to you 
um, that you may not have been able to do more than talk about um, or write about on social media. A poem gives you the opportunity to, to really focus on the language used to discuss an issue and, and process it and sort of make it your own. Um, so we're going to talk, you know, about found poems where we use existing text. Um, I think of it as sort of a collage. Um, there's different ways to do this, and Randy and I are going to show you different ways to do this. Um, but to start, I thought I'd show you an example. Uh, give me a second. Um, this is, all right, can everybody see this? Yeah, can everybody see in Alabama? Yeah. I hope so. <laughs> I'm looking at Nancy Cooler, so as long as she's nodding up and down. <laughs> All right, so this is a, a clearly a use of erasure. It's the poet is uh, Reginald Dwayne Butts from his um, from his uh, third book of poems, Felon. Now he's an American poet who was sentenced as an adult when he was 16 years old um, for a carjacking. He was held in prison. He was held in solitary confinement and somebody passed a book under his, a poetry book under his, into his cell. And um, he is now a major American poet. He's also a practicing lawyer. He went to Yale Law School. So what he did with, with these uh, poems, um, and there's a bunch of them in, in his, his book, is he uses erasure to kind of address um, the, the, issues he sees as a lawyer where um, people are, are, can't make bail. Um, and they kind of, it kind of reveals the way that process impacts these people living in poverty. So you can see what he does, and this is actually published in his book. So he uses erasure, as you can see, and just takes out um, the words that, um, he wants to, and then you're left with focusing on the people um, who are affected by this policy, you know, because apparently, and, and Randy knows more about this than me, and I know there's some attorneys and even a judge on this uh, conversation today, but these long, long legal documents, often the, the human story is lost in the shuffle. Um, so he's really interested in, in, he thinks of this as kind of redaction. You know, we all are familiar with sort of those FBI documents from the 50s where material is redacted. And that's another way you can, can look at it. So essentially the poem would read the plaintiffs impoverished jail by the city, unable to pay traffic tickets, pay or sit in jail $50 a day. So you get the sense of, of, of how this works. And I thought it would help to see it. I also wanted to show you the cover of his book because in a way he uses erasure on the cover of his book. This is the cover of the book, Felon. And um, in, in that, it, he, he talks about how that it also um, represents something underneath um, so that they kind of exist together. And um, that's, that's really, um, kind of what the way you another way to think about it. Um, all right, so I think, oh, let me see, I will hand it over to Randy. Thank you so much, Marjorie, for that great introduction and some examples of found poetry. So, yeah, just quick background on me because it impacts my poetic practice. Um, I was a lawyer in the United States working with immigrants who were victims of violent crime. And a lot of my poetry started around that experience. And never, of course, as a lawyer, being able to share anything that happens between me and my clients. Uh, and so I started, restarted, I should say, writing poetry in order to work through a lot of what was happening because it, it's quite difficult to work all you know over and over with victims of trauma as some of you might know and then you may have trauma in your own background and be re-traumatized you know and so poetry really became a way for me to work through those types of feelings and emotions and experiences and then I moved to Iceland where I'm not a lawyer anymore. I'm the director of a center for writing at the University of Iceland. But I started with a, uh, with nine other, well, eight other women 
a small press here called Osprasan. And the idea behind this press is to bring marginalized uh, voices into the mainstream of Icelandic literature, which is a long history, but it's also very homogeneous. So, you know, that's been something that I've kept up with here. But in my own practice of writing poetry, I often worked with work with found poetry um, in the in the context of taking legal documents uh, and messing around with them. Uh, but that's something we can get to later because Marjorie and I, when we first started talking about this, we all got so excited about found poetry and what you can do. But we, we said, okay, we've got to limit ourselves to erasure. We can't just go crazy and like open up the whole, like what you can do with found poetry. Then we're happy to have those discussions after we go through the erasure part of it. So as Marjorie shared uh, Beth's work, I wanna share really a very, I, what is for me like a very impactful uh, work of erasure. And so let me get that up on the screen. And now this is by a man named Tom Phillips. And the work is called a humament, which you will see why it is called a humament when I open that up and share it with you. And his work, as you can see, hopefully now on, on your screens as well, is available online. And he found this book, um, which let's just go to, um, you know, which was called, I believe, The Human Experiment. And so he even started by using erasure in the title to take The Human Experiment and change the title to Humament. So that's the title of his book. And this was a full book uh, written in the 1800s. And so he just started working on this, on this book and he's done two passes at least through the book now. Uh, and he shares the work with us online. So I'm just gonna open up um, any page. You can see it's quite visually attractive, right? You're, you're just like, oh my gosh, what's going on here in these texts? And is it really a text? Is it a picture and a text? What the heck is going on? But luckily you can go ahead and click on a page um, and it loads up for you. Oh, the human document, excuse me, that, that was the original title. Um, and you see the original page that he was working with. You see his first pass through, right? So from all of this text here on this long page, the only thing he kept was venture on a piece of sleep. I am going myself to shut the door art as an art curiosity, right? And then it goes on to the next. So that was his first pass through. And you see him taking this long text and creating a totally new piece from it. And then he did another pass through the pages. And in this case, he completely changed what he decided to keep and what he decided to erase, right? Uh, that's not the case on all of his examples. Sometimes he kept much of the same text from one pass to the next, but this is a lovely example of just how artistic you can go with this type of work, right? Where the Betts example is very much this idea of redacting and removing and erasure as an actual powerful form or a poetic tool in and of itself. Now, I really do want to get at this idea of like the tool of found poetry. And I'm going to stop sharing, um, though I will do just pop over to a couple of things, because one thing that Marjorie and I, and really we talk about quite a bit in found poetry is the idea of ethics around found poetry, right? And we're, we're saying, okay, you're taking another piece of text and you're really going at it and you're really changing it and you're making it your own. But of course there's ethics around that as well. So I've got an example here, Vanessa Place. Some of you may be familiar with her work. She's a defense attorney in Los Angeles who defends sex offenders. But then in her poetry practice, she actually reads uh, transcripts of the sex offenders victims, uh, you know, and so that's her practice. This is not without ethical issues, I would like to point out, right? And she has, has gotten pushback about her ethical issues. Now she stands on the altar of its art. I can do what I want. You can make up your own mind. One of the most um, ethically sticky examples of found work, not erasure, but found work uh, in recent time. And maybe some of you are aware of this, 
uh, is Kenneth Goldsmith, who is a very popular conceptual poet who just read the autopsy of Michael Brown. He performed it as a poet, as a poem, as a piece of more performance poetry, right? This was a completely found text. It's not even erasure. So it's not even like he's using this text to create his own. He just read it. Obviously this got quite a bit of pushback, right? So when we're working with found text, we always have to be aware of the ethics around working with that text. And that's one reason we asked you to just go for um, texts in the newspaper that you might have found on current events. I really enjoy working with legal texts, like I said. So I did, um, I used a technique called mapping, which is similar to erasure on a, a memo called The Matter of AB, which is about immigration. Um, you know, so it's, there are all sorts of texts you can work with, but you just need to be very mindful of the ethics of what's behind that. And I'm going to pass that over to Marjorie because her work really touches on those issues directly. Okay, thank you. That was that was great. Um, you know, somehow we'll make sure that if you're interested in all these links and whatnot, and some of the poets we suggested that you will we'll share that later with all of you. Um, so now we're going to each share some of our work and 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 talk about. Um, the process and, and like Randy, um, I was doing work. Um, I worked in refugee resettlement. I worked, um, did a lot of human rights work with Amnesty International and, um, you know, found myself wanting to um, really what what's called in the poetry world bear witness to um, what I was what I was observing and um, poetry became um, a way for me to do that. Um, and I'm so glad Randy talked about sort of the ethics uh, involved with this. Um, you know, there's there's another whole controversy about, you know, whose story, who who has the right to tell someone else's story? And, um, you know, there's a there's a fine line between um, sort of misappropriating someone's story and then being an honest witness. And that's a huge subject, which maybe we'll do another one and just talk about that, Randy. Um, but one way around that, of course, is it is using someone else's um, testimony or language um, in a way that um, may uh, give more weight to what you wanna say. So I'm gonna show you a couple of examples. Um, so what I did, um, let's see. Okay, so this is a, a poem I'm gonna share with you. Um, and it's based on an editorial by Roxane Gay. Now, many of you know her writing. She, she is um, a very well-known um, essayist. Um, she's a feminist lesbian. She teaches at uh, Purdue, I think. And um, this is the article. It was an editorial in 2016 in the New York Times. Now, I'm gonna really focus on poems that I've written that have grown out of um, uh, racism in the place where I live, which is Charleston, South Carolina. Now, a couple of things I need to tell you. Um, in April of 2015, um, an unarmed African-American man named Walter Scott who grew up with my husband's best friend in Charleston, was shot in the back seven times by a North Charleston police officer named Michael Slager. That was April. Um, it was caught on video. And then three months later, we had the Emanuel Church massacre in Charleston in June. And a lot of people who don't know this place don't know that these things happened um, very close together and are both, of course, just horrific examples of, of, of racism um, in our society. So, so Roxanne wrote this editorial a year later um, when Alton Sterling was murdered, um, an armed African-American man murdered by a policeman. And what I did, and this is, a, this is, I know we're not gonna have time to get into all the manifestations of found poetry, but for those of you uncomfortable with actually erasing, you know, this is what I do. I find a text that I really like, and I um, I highlight the the language that just sort of jumps into it, jumps out at me. And what I'm going to do is just share a couple of these lines, and then I'm going to read the poem. I, then I make the poem my own. Um, 
and he, here's the line, Black Lives Matter, and then in an instant they don't. Um, and you can look at this article later. It was in the New York Times. Um, it's now a permanent part of the American memory. Um, complicit in this spectacle of black death, it is an interminable, um, so hopeless, so out of words in the face of it, judge, jury, executioner, due process in the parking lot. So it, the, you can kind of see my process and um, I don't know how to, I don't know how to believe change is possible. So what I did was um, take a lot of these phrases and create a poem written in, this is in couplets. It's called um, So Out of Words. And I used a lot of her text. And then um, there's a section of it that is very much situated in Charleston where Walter Scott was killed in a sort of a public area five minutes from where um, one of my sons went to high school. So I'm gonna share the poem with you. So out of words. In a world where too many people have their fingers on the triggers of guns aimed directly at black people, we have borne witness time and time again to executions filmed on tiny cameras, which is allow us to see too much, which allow us to see not enough. Judge, jury, executioner, it's due process in the suburbs and the city streets on winding country roads and highways, sidewalks in front of the convenience store where the street lights don't shine in the back corner of a parking lot, on the playground behind the fence, in a field near your children's school, on the street in front of your house. This interminable spectacle of black death playing on a loop over and over again until we become numb to something that is now a permanent part of the American memory. How do these grainy videos not translate into justice? I just don't know how to believe change is possible when there is so much evidence to the contrary. I am so out of words in the face of such brutality. Black lives matter and then in an instant, they don't. Um, and of course, um, that should be a couplet there. Um, I was published in a magazine, Sojourners, um, and I give credit to the editorial and, you know, she's, we've had some tweets going back and forth about it. But um, so that's one poem. And then I'm gonna share one other that's sort of tied to it. Um, and uh, this is the John, C. Calhoun Monument in Charleston. And it came down in June. And um, that's Mother Emanuel Church where Dylan Roof killed nine African-Americans after Bible study. So this was right across the street from it. And um, before it was taken down, there was a huge national movement to get this monument down. And I was asked to write a poem about it. And um, I'm showing you a couple of things just because as Randy said, some of these issues about ethics and language, you know, come up. This, when this poem was published, and this is the poem, I'll show it to you. It's a Confederate dialogue between John C. Calhoun and Dylan Storm Roof. But um, when I was putting this together, I found the editor's note. Readers may find words in this poem to be disturbing, but they are real reflections of South Carolina's racist past and present. Um, and then there's, you know, a little bit more. It, 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 it's, it's a dialogue between John C. Calhoun and uh, white supremacist Dylan Roof. So they wrote their text 150 years apart. And, um, you know, John C. Calhoun was a vice president of the United States. And part of what I wanted to do in using their these two texts were um, to remind people that these racist ideas that Calhoun embodied and, and Dylan Roof, um, you know, acted upon are not new in American, um, in the American sort of vocabulary. And it, I wanted it to be a conversation between them. And the poem can either be read, um, you know, horizontally or vertically. It's very hard to read. I will read it anyway, and then we'll, we'll move on. Um, so I didn't change a word. Now, the first poem I showed you I used some of Roxane Gay's texts and kind of created a new poem. And in this poem, it was very important to me that it was 100% their, their 
words. Um, and the hardest part was because John Calhoun was writing in the 1800s. He was right, you know, giving speeches in Congress, giving speeches on the street. Um, you had very formal use of the English language. Dylan Roof, who dropped out of Lexington High School in South Carolina in ninth grade, um, his syntax really didn't match up. And that was really the hardest part. So I'm going to read it across a Confederate dialogue between John C. Calhoun and Dylan Storm Roof. All men are not born free. It is all based on historical lies. All men are not created equal. We are in fact superior. Distinguished by color, black people are racially aware. The black race of Central Africa, they are an enigma. The black race came savage, they are still our enemies. According to the Bible, niggers are stupid and violent. According to the Bible, niggers have lower IQs. According to the Bible, niggers have lower impulse control. According to the Bible, niggers have high testosterone levels in general. I am not afraid to attack error. Christianity is a warrior's religion. I appeal to the facts. Look at history. Under the care of our institutions, some masters didn't allow whipping. Slavery is a good a positive good. Segregation was not a bad thing. Abolition and the union cannot coexist. One day there will be a race war. Without drenching the country in blood, one day there will be a race war. The South will not surrender. One day there will be a race war. In order to preserve society, one day there will be a race war. Our union and government are doomed. The South is beyond saving. We must meet the enemy on the frontier. We have too many blacks here. My friends of the South, white people are being murdered in the streets. What are you prepared to do? Now we have to get revenge. If we do not defend ourselves, we have no future. None will defend us. Who is fighting for the white people? The South must rise up. No one is stopping us. If we submit, we will be trampled. I have no choice. The time is at hand. I took action for my race. Man cannot exist in such a state. I am not sorry. This deadly war is waged. White it is. Um, I hate reading that poem for obvious reasons, but um, uh, and I there's a couple things in parentheses here because that's exactly the way Dylan Roof wrote it. Um, you notice I don't use punctuation. It, it just made it more difficult to match up the text. Um, so these are the kinds of decisions that you make eventually. Um, and of course, every stanza, which is, you know, looks like a paragraph, is, is four lines. Um, so these are two very different examples of found poetry um, that are tied to um, you know, the legacy of racism in, in the place that I come from. Um, and if I hadn't written a lot about it already, I would have been very reluctant to, tr to even attempt the Confederate dialogue poem. Um, but I'm gonna hand it over to Randy. Great, thanks, Marjorie. Um, sorry, I unmuted myself and it's telling me I need to unmute myself. Whatever. Uh, so as you can see, like, and, you know, as the uh, Youth Poet Laureate highlighted in her fabulous spoken piece wor uh, work during the inauguration, uh, and if you haven't checked out Amanda Gorman's work, I highly recommend it. She's uh, primarily working in spoken word, at least that's what she's recorded. It's a really fabulous and amazingly powerful poetry form as, war as well. Like, so, you know, Marjorie and, and Amanda, and, and then the piece I'm going to share quickly with you are really around issues that are very prevalent in society today. And when I came to Iceland and I took on, for better or worse, the identity of an immigrant, I worked through a lot of the uh, ambivalence and, and difficulty around that, and I'm still working through it in poetry. And so the one that I'm going to share with you, though I'm not going to read the whole thing because it's quite long, um, is called Interrogatories. So let me get that up on the screen because I think it just uh, makes more sense if you can see what I'm talking about. So this is 
a standard if you're a lawyer if you're in the legal field this is actually found text as far as this is a standard interrogatories form that you might get in a legal battle when one side is demanding answers of the others and this is very important it is this feeling of i am demanding an answer of you and if you do not answer there will be legal ramifications i can bring the court in if you refuse to answer so what i did was i took this interrogatories i even took the format of a common format of uh legal documents in court cases in the united states and i put it all together but the questions themselves are ones that immigrants in Iceland get asked over and over and over again, or ones that I personally have been asked by Icelanders um, because there is this feeling that when you're an immigrant, and maybe many of you have experienced this because many of us have lived in several different cultures, when you are not of the dominant culture, there is this uh, societal expectation that the people who are part of the dominant culture can demand answers of you at any time and place. Uh, and if you do not produce those answers, there will be some sort of ramification against you. Um, and so taking this to the extreme, this is what I came up with. And then, um, so question one, how do you like Iceland? Seemingly innocuous question, but when you've been asked 5,000 times and you've lived here a while, it wears on you, right? And then all of the instructions about how to answer are literally taken from the found text from standard interrogatory text themselves. And then my answer is then myself, um, you know, answering this question. Um, and it goes on with instructions and it tells you how to answer the questions. And as the piece go on, the person answering the question gets less and less inclined to play this game and it just becomes more and more belligerent because of the constant othering that happens when when dominant cultures demand answers of people who are not in dominant cultures but as you can say these are it's three pages long um now specifically language is a huge flashpoint here in iceland and the use of language and which language you use uh, so often we get asked as immigrants, how's your Icelandic going? Um, and then, you know, that comes up with like, okay, so how's your Icelandic coming along? It's another innocuous question, but we all know we get these loaded questions that the subtext is entirely different than the set of instructions from the found text. And this is the answer. And I say, yeah, fine. For this fact, I relied on almost countless encounters with Icelandic speakers in stores, cafes, restaurants, gas stations, libraries, and the like about daily needs and necessities in Icelandic. It would be impossible to identify with particularity every person I have spoken to in Icelandic, but you can try my teacher, the teachers at my son's schools if you like. As for experts, you can ask the three teachers who have taught me Icelandic if I am, in fact, doing fine, right? So even though I'm answering, I'm actually taking the, the exact words in the found text and turning them around and using them uh, against the person who is demanding the answers as well. Um, this is coming out in an anthology in spring where I've gone further and this formal text will be translated into Icelandic uh, along with a very formal email to a doctor uh, but the more intimate texts of the, because the idea is about immigration, the more intimate text of um, navigating crossing cultures within a family will be in English. So, you know, to push it even further to say, okay, when I'm, when I'm writing about the, the language of my heart and my family, it's going to be in English. But when I'm forced to do these formal interactions, then they will be in Icelandic. Um, so that's just a little bit of a, of a segue into what we would like you to do, which is what we're going to go into now. So we asked you to show up with a preferably printed out piece of text uh, that appeals to you. Uh, we, we said, okay, uh, if it's sort of human rights or what's going on in the world today, that would be great. But literally any text you found that appeals to you will do. And I said, okay, it would be great if you showed up with some colored pencils and markers, because personally, when I'm doing this type of work, or actually when I'm doing many writing projects, I start with a very physical activity of going at it very physically with pens in my hands. Maybe I'll print the text out huge. Maybe I'll even put it up on a board. 
uh, because I find the physicality of it is quite cathartic as much as as the actually doing the text. But whatever mode you have is fabulous. And what we're going to do is we're going to put you into breakout rooms and your time in the breakout room is going to be split into three. First, we would like you to just chat with each other about who you are and the text that you brought. So please try to focus on the text, what type of text it is, uh, why you chose it, what appeals to you. And then we're going to ask you to spend some time working quietly uh, on erasure. And what we mean by this is take your markers and start just marking out, redacting like that lovely Greggy Rebutts example, crossing out, uh, you know, be as physical as you want and, and just go out the text. Now, as Marjorie said, some people may feel like somehow we're doing something wrong. Um, and if that is your feeling, then you can be more gentle and you can highlight text that you would like to use and you can underline um, that's possibility as well. If you're not sure exactly how to attack the text, um, you can start by just saying, you know what, I'm just going to take and I'm going to erase all the prepositions. I'm going to erase all the prepositions in this text and I'm going to see what that ha what happens to the text visually and on the page as, as a written text. And now once I've done that, I'm going to go and I'm going to work on all of the adverbs, you know, what happens with that text. So this is just some idea if you're having a hard time interacting in the text where you can start. You're going to do that for approximately 10 minutes and then we're going to give you a little time in the breakout rooms, which will be four to five people. Uh, to just chat about the process. How was the process for you? Was it useful? What what did you really like or what did you not like? Because chatting and with what are we, 27 people can be a little bit overwhelming. However, we would like to offer anybody that wants to share their work once they're done with the breakout room time, that possibility. If you, when we come back to the main group, if you want to share your work, please send a message to Karen our technology master, and she will line it up. So we give everybody a chance who hopefully, though that might be a little hard with the time, we give people a chance to share and we don't come back to a cacophony of you know people just really wanting to share because this can be very exciting work and we hope you get excited about it. And we hope that you get like emotional and worked up and you wanna share. But um, two things, there is never a requirement to share ever in anything I facilitate around poetry and especially poetry and, and like things we care about, never a requirement to share. Second, there is no requirement that your text has to be in English or in any other language that anybody else here may understand. You know, um, hopefully you've chosen a, a text that speaks to you for some reason. And if that text is in English, fabulous. If it's not, if it's in any other language that you have access to, fabulous as well. Please don't feel like you have to um, only do English text. And if you feel like sharing, even if your text is not in English and you don't think anybody will understand the literal meaning, please do it anyway. Uh, one thing we would talk about in OS uh, is that meaning is not always just literal meaning. Meaning can be created in so many ways. Uh, so I just want to encourage you, you know, the whatever language you're working in, don't let that, don't hold back if you really want to share your text. Um, Marjorie and I are available for questions. We're not going to be in breakout rooms, but if you have a question, then message Corinne or Marjorie or I, and then um, we can come in and we can answer your questions. Quick run through, five, 10 minutes of sharing your text and why, why you chose that text, five, 10 minutes of practicing erasure, and then five or 10 minutes at the end to share how the process went for you if you have questions, don't be shy about calling us in and we'd be happy to um, talk to you. We just don't want to come in as supposed experts and like dampen the, the mood in the room before everybody gets a chance to really chat together. Yeah. We're back. We're back. It was really good. <laughs> We're back. A volunteer. <laughs> yeah, so if you want to share then please message Corinne. She's as the tech master is the one that's going to like, be like, you're first, you're next, you're next. <clears throat> We're about 15 minutes behind time. So okay. we plan to have 30 <laughs> minutes now. 
but we only have about 15 minutes until we're officially done. That said, uh, I think Marjorie and I are fine by for us extending it another 15 minutes. But if you have some sort of time pressure and you really need to leave, but you really want to share, please indicate that in the message to Corinne as well. And Corinne, as soon as you get people in, just like call them out and yeah. let's go. <clears throat> Isabel, you're up. Okay. Um, so for context, I decided that I needed a little bit of levity in my day. So I picked a children's book. Yeah, it's, oh, cool. it's called 68 Rooms, which I got from my cousin when I was a little bit too old for it. So I never fully delved into it, which is why I picked it in a sense to kind of pick up and do something new with. So I kind of used two pages and combined them into one. So what I found is now can exist the past can't, the key, the only connection, the magnificent space guarded, an impressive weight on me for clues shed some light why this magic worked, a book, a prayer. Ooh. Oh, wow. Very nice. nice. A good one. Very nice. Gorgeous. Beautiful. Gorgeous. Thank you so much, Isabel. Ramona, you're up. Can, can you skip me? I'm, I need an, a minute. <laughs> <laughs> I would if anyone else had volunteered. Oh, would no. anybody else like to go? I'll, I'll volunteer. Thanks, Paula. Go ahead. But, okay, I, I might mess up because I just circled the words I want. So um, <laughs> should, did I, should I tell you like what the original text was about? Yes. Okay, the original text was um, the joint communique from uh, the French Minister for Europe and Foreign Affairs and the French Minister for Ecologi Ecological Transition. And it was a communique that they sent out because the United States has now officially rejoined the Paris Climate Agreement. So, yeah. <laughs> the United Climate issued for ecological transition. People elected agreement, fight climate change. Decision made, determined action, welcome back. Together, change our planet. Notably hard, citizens are strong. Movement, ambition take place. Organized respect. Accelerate new green, no cooperation and solidarity, preserving our planet, leadership stepping up, achieve, achieve, we, uh, sorry, <laughs> um, achieve. We need, uh, achieve, we need, we hope, rejoin this beyond success, protection and preservation. Wow, very um, good. That was really so good. Paula, I know you said I don't want to mess it up, but actually the repetition of achieve towards the end was really, really impactful. Like, oh. you know, it was really, really impactful and just, I think, added a lot to the piece. So sometimes what we consider a mistake actually ends up just having an amazing amount of, of impact. So I was going to say, Paula, you, um, were, you were reading off the you hadn't put it all together yet. You were just reading, right? Yeah, I um, I, I like circled, I yeah. circled the words that I wanted to keep and, and that's kind of where I got lost. Where got, yeah, <laughs> no, but the other thing to say, and I, I don't know what, the, I was sort of see, I can kind of see it in my head when you were reading the words. Um, don't be afraid to play around with the order um, when you really ah, are working okay. on these. Okay. And I, you know, that's sort of advice to everybody. I mean, oftentimes, and that's true with anything we're writing, you know, but so particularly true. with these, you might find you get this really interesting, dramatic juxtaposition if you, you know, some of the things you said, I thought, oh, wow, I wonder if she started with that, you, you know? So okay. that's kind of how you, once you get it on the page, you can play around with it. Like but can, can you add a word like from yeah, time to time? Yeah, 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 absolutely. You you make uh, your own rules now that you've- oh, okay. think, about, think about these, think about this. Let's say we were a painter or an, a, a, an art, a visual artist. We have to have your paints, right? Or your clay or your, you know, your, your, your uh, 
you know, paints and, and uh, what have you. Well, words are your material. Think about it that way. Just think yeah, about it. Now I, I have often... some materials to work with. I might take red and blue and make purple. Okay. What's wrong with I that? My, right? Does that metaphor, make sense? The metaphor of baking. We all can yeah. have the ingredients. We can all have the instructions, okay. but we're all going to end up with a different cake. Mm -hmm. you know, because we're all, we're all individuals that we're bringing to this work. So mm -hmm. don't be afraid to personalize your cake for your own outcome that you want. Okay. Can I ask one question, Corinne? Sure. I was just, uh, because we talked about using different languages and, and I am I'm a non-native English speaker. And I was wondering, there are several languages that have different grammatical structures. So I'm thinking about German, for instance, or Russian, <laughs> where you have, uh, you know, the verbs change if it's a motion. It's a, how do you deal with that? Because in English, it's easy to, to cut and paste. But if, if, if you start thinking in Italian, you would have a, a third person, a second person. How can you, can you change that or you, you're bound to use what you have? Again, I think it depends on what your output, you know, what you have in mind for your output to be. Uh, for example, I have pieces where I blend languages because I literally don't want any one human being to understand all of the piece. I actually want to invoke quite a bit of discomfort in my reader. And I want them only to get one third to two thirds or depending on how many languages I'm using of the story, right? So I think in that case, because Icelandic is similar, it has a very strong case structures around both nouns and verbs. And it's really, really, I, it depends on my audience and my purpose. I may want to actually deliberately make mistakes, you know, because I want to jar people. I want to wake them up. I want them to question or I may just say, okay, these are the, like Marjorie said, this is my material. This is my word set, which I've also done as well. Like, here's my set of words that I'm going to use. And then I can use these set of words however I wish. I can change, you know, the declinations. I can change the tenses um, or anything along that spectrum. Uh, you know, it's your material. You get to decide. And when, when you translate poetry, Sylvia, you're really writing a new poem, you know, in a way. So think about it that way. You know, you, it, it, you, know, you, you can't exactly replicate um, the syntax, you know, whatever, depending on language, um, especially if there's, you know, some kind of meter or, or sound pattern. Um, so, you know, you're, you're kind of making a new poem anyway. And that's kind of what this is, if you think about it. Does I'll try. I'll, I'll just try and surprise myself. I'll just pick an Italian <laughs> or Dutch text and try to work with that and see how it comes out. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Good question, okay. though. Thanks so much, Paula. Ramona, are you ready now? Great. Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah, I'm ready. All right. Um, so the article is a uh, technology dispatches from the Atlantic of Atlantic Monthly, to November 2015. <clears throat> Uh, and it's called Moving to Mars and how humans will find a home beyond Earth. And it, I, these dispatches don't happen anymore, but the idea is it's kind of a short article about uh, current technology and how it can be broadened um, into kind of the, the more science fiction realm of what's possible. Okay, so. Beyond aerospace engineers, entrepreneurs and researchers, Robots inhabit Mars's lava tubes underground like a cardiovascular system. Somewhere in space, vessels at zero gravity float in a space fence. Robots in the moon's orbit floating away, pull an asteroid, mine it for water and oxygen, have big reserves of water, a good alternative. The moon, its gravity one seventh that of Earth, can't breathe. Descend back to Earth at the speed of light, about 13 seconds. Very good. Very good. That was, that was amazing. I, I was just going to say something I forgot to say oh. before, that using scientific text, let alone a, an article in Atlanta, um, is really uh, something a lot of poets do. And um, I actually met a teacher 
who uses this technique to teach science. In other words, she's teaching, just, I don't mean to digress, but it, it, you, you made me think of it, Ramona. Um, so she'll take a text and she'll say to the, the students, um, you know, find the words you like, find the words you don't like. And she has them do like kind of use erasure and found poems with a text. And she uses that to teach. Um, she said, especially with really difficult material, it, it gives, you know, less language helps them. Um, they just pick some words and um, she's had great success at that. So it's just interesting. Um, I, and um, I, I'm so glad you did something like that. I thought that was wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. And I just wanted to say the thing that I was doing, I was having a hard time writing and rearranging. So basically you I like, I, I wrote <laughs> down all of, yeah. This, I have done found poetry before, I admit. Yeah. But I was like, I can't rewrite this fast enough right now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, with scientific text, this is a technique that I've used, um, especially if they, so in a, in a longer, very formal journal article, I will take a table and I will use that table as instructions to find words. So if the table has three numbers, I say, okay, this first number is the page that I'm supposed to go to. This second number is the line I'm supposed to go to. And this third number is the word in that I'm supposed to go to. And that's uh, just a way I will use to collect my personal vocabulary that I'm going to use to create the poem out of that scientific text. Uh, and there's a whole methodology called poetic inquiry. Yeah. That is a methodology around how you can use poetic methods to inquire of text, just like it's a, or inquire of life or inquire of, you know, whatever. And it, it can be a very powerful tool uh, to understand text differently, gain meaning, you know, do all of these things. There's a great book called Poetic Inquiry that if anybody's interested, I highly recommend. Can I share something? Yes, please. Yes. All right. So, hi. Uh, so in my breakaway, uh, my breakout session, I did mention that I'm not really a poet or anything. So I'm a pharmacologist. And I, I work in the Netherlands. So now finally everybody knows what I do because the COVID vaccine came out. It's like, oh, that's what you do. So, <laughs> what do. so now, and the, the text that I chose was about uh, COVID and the vaccines and the equality in distribution and where Africa is in the whole conversation. And it was interesting because then I cut it down to what I just, you know, just the things that struck, uh, came out to me. And just to read very quickly, I chose Africa will follow all the rules. The same rule, whether it's in Europe or wherever. But is that equal? The hangover from a colonial mentality has to stop. That first line, that first line yeah. just gave me the chills. Like yeah. that was just beautiful. How mm. many lines is the poem? Well, it's quite long. Oh. <laughs> just a few things. And then I just had like an excerpt and then I took out from that same excerpt, just a few things, which is really following the rules, whether they apply to you or not, mm -hmm. the colonial mentality around it and behavior and the reaction to the situation coming from all that mentality. Mm -hmm. So it, wow. it's, a, it's a loop, but that's what yeah. came out. So for a pharmacologist, for someone like me, I was thinking about my own background, living abroad and seeing how everything is evolving, listening to everyone's, you know, comments about the situation, what Africans are thinking, what Europeans and Americans are thinking, what the Western world is thinking, just the whole context of things. Wow, powerful. Yeah, really I think impactful. you're a poet, and now we know yeah. it. <laughs> Did you ever get to start a conversation by saying I'm not a poet again in your life? Yeah, none of that, none of that. <laughs> so, um, as Randy and Marjorie said, they're very happy to stay on for another 15 minutes, but we do realize that the official end time was was now. So, Sylvia is going to do a quick close out, but that does not mean you have to stop sharing or that you don't want to do anything further. It's just for us to to put an ending on this. So, Sylvia, go ahead. Yes. Um, um, I am, yes. Uh, for one thing, may, maybe, Corinne, you can put it all on grid and we can try and take a photograph, a snapshot, if, uh, 
to use if we can but there are so many of you y'all don't fit on one screen don't fit okay <laughs> then no no photo i took a couple of screenshots with marjorie and randy <sighs> and i want to thank uh marjorie randy and nadia abdo he says i keep calling her <laughs> for creating this serendipitous moment and 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 bringing us all together uh i was very skeptical not very a little bit skeptical in the beginning and Randy knows that, and I'm I'm, I'm so excited that uh, her enthusiasm and and uh, uh, convinced me to go ahead because this was absolutely mind blowing, and um, I've learned a lot, and I hope you all have learned. I saw smiling faces faces all over, old friends, new friends, and I think it's been great. And I have I can see myself now erasing things from time to time, and 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 working on on creating my own poems, trying different languages. So thank you so much, Marjorie and Randy, for opening up this new world, definitely to me, and I think to, to everyone else. Um, I will send out a note to all people who had registered. Quite a few couldn't sign up. And I will add to that note uh, any additional information that Randy and Marjorie might send to me. So if you have any links, additional article, additional information you'd like to share with the group, please do send it to me and I'll send out something uh, in the next uh, couple of days. To all participants, if you have ideas for future workshops, literary or not, please send them to me. This is how this workshop uh, came into fruition. Randy emailed me and then the whole ball started rolling. So if you know alums who have something to share or can share, please do. If we want to do more poetry, please let us know. And um, we hope that uh, lockdowns and pandemics will end one day, but I don't see a reason why we should stop doing these workshops and organize these gatherings. I think it's miraculous to bring together people from all over the world and all generations and classes and, and share and learn from each other. So uh, please stay in touch. Uh, on behalf of the European Alumni Council, I want to thank everyone and uh, wish everyone a nice weekend and um, stay safe and stay healthy wherever you are.